അടുത്തതായി ശ്രീ ടെൻസൻ സുണ്ടു ആദേശവൽക്കരിക്കപ്പെട്ട ടിബറ്റ് ജനത മനുഷ്യാവകാശം ശാന്തി സംസ്കാരം അവകാശം ഒരു ആഗോള സംവാദം എന്ന വിഷയത്തെക്കുറിച്ച് നമ്മളോട് സംസാരിക്കുന്നു ശ്രീ ടെൻസൻ സുണ്ടു ഇസ് എൻ ഇന്ത്യൻ ബോൺ ടിബറ്റൻ റൈറ്റർ ആൻഡ് ആക്ടിവിസ്റ്റ് He is the award winning author of four books and is currently working on a fifth. Sundu combines activism and academia, touring colleges all over India and giving lectures on exile writing, resistance, culture and identity. If his speaking has taken him to 20 foreign countries including Germany, the US, the UK, Taiwan and France, his political activism has sent him to jail 16 times. In early 2021 he led a walk a mile for Tibet campaign that saw him walk 500 km from Dharmashala to Delhi before later embarking on an 127 day Himalayan hike to draw attention to China's aggressive expansionist policies Sundu's writing has inspired plays films and poetry in different languages his writings have been translated into 15 languages and are taught in schools and universities in india and abroad he studied literature and philosophy at the universities of madras and bombay and is an alumnus of the tibetan children's village school let me take the privilege of inviting our esteemed guest sri tenzin sundu to please come up on to the stage for delivering the talk on space shift of tibet a global discussion on culture peace and human rights welcome sir to Peruvanam International Village Festival 2023 over to you now sir Namo Today is the fifth day of Tibetan New Year. We recently uh, celebrated the New Year. And in Tibet, the Tibetan New Year, Losar, is celebrated for 15 days. But because we are now refugees living in India, in someone else's country, uh, we've, uh, we have actually lost the festivity of the festival uh, we've been refugees in india for 65 years in fact i am myself born in india educated here alarkum namaskaram and when i speak some words of uh, malayalam or tamil it's not to show off for me this is the language that i know நான் மட்ரஸில் காலேஜ் படிச்சிச்சேன் இந்த கொஞ்சம் தமிழ் தெரியும் கொஞ்சம் எழுதுறீங்க கொஞ்சம் பறிக்கிறேன் தெரியும் சிசி ஹியர் இஸ் அ டெபெட்டன் ஹூ ஸ்பீக்ஸ் ஹிந்தி டமல் லிட்டில் பிட் ஆஃப் மலையாளம் ஆல்சோ அண்டர்ஸ்டாண்ட் மராத்தி மெனி லாங்குவேஜஸ் இன் இண்டியா ஐ ஹவ் மஸ்ட் ஆஃப் ட்ராவல்ட் மோர் இன் இண்டியா தென் எனி ஆஃப் யூ திஸ் நாட் அ ஸ்டேட் ஐ ஹவ் நாட் ட்ராவல்ஸ் டூ So you see, very often, sometimes with my Indian friends, I uh, teasingly joke with them and say that I am more Indian than you. But in reality, I'm not a citizen here. I'm a refugee. When I say I'm a refugee, many of my Indian friends who feel close to me say, don't say that, you're not a refugee. But in reality, I am not a citizen of this country. Now what had happened with me is that China invaded our country Tibet in 1949. There was 10 years of tussle between the Tibetans fighting for the freedom of Tibet and China invading our country. And towards the end of course they were much more militarily powerful country. His holiness the Dalai Lama had to escape Tibet come to India. seek asylum and since 1959 onwards 
almost about one lakh Tibetans have sought asylum in this country and we have been living as refugees here. We hope to return to our country one day and therefore our idea uh, was never to settle down here. So a refugee is someone who has lost the independence of a country. There's a fear of persecution. We had to run away. So therefore, the previous speaker who was UN uh, head in, in, in that uh, African country, you would understand what a refugee would mean. But because we have a dream to return to our country, we are unable to settle down here. And, but, but, and because our struggle is freedom from China, a country about which most other countries are either trading or are scared of. So therefore, we do not have a single country supporting the independence movement of Tibet. So therefore, our future looks bleak. We are in that situation. And my case is even worse. I didn't escape Tibet. I'm born in India. I'm, I was born refugee. So if I am asked, where are you from? I cannot say I'm from Dharamshala. I'm actually coming from Dharamshala. I live in Himachal Pradesh. But my parents are in Karnataka. So obviously with this kind of face, I cannot say I'm from Karnataka. It's differently placed. So the idea of home has been really challenging me intellectually and even physically. Where, where do I call home? So I've recently written a book called Nowhere to Call Home. So if we want to discuss home, perhaps I will win. Because I've done everything in this. So we've been leading this freedom movement for 70 years. And in 70 years of freedom struggle, I have discussed the idea of home from so many different angles. But most of, obviously, of course, it's a political independence of Tibet. And this is not an unreasonable, uh, over-the-top kind of a demand. There are 205 UN-recognized independent countries. We are, uh, what we are demanding, or what we aspire, is one among 205 or 206 independent countries. Nothing short, or nothing too demanding than that. But the deeper question for me is not the political independence, but the personal freedom. You see, there is a difference. Independence and freedom. Independence is a status. It's like marriage. Hum shadi ho gaya. It's a status. Independence is a status. You raise your flag, you have a border, and you have international relations with other, other countries. But freedom is much deeper. Freedom is not a status. Freedom is a process. And one needs to work on that idea of freedom every day. There are many independent countries, but many of them actually do not enjoy freedom in those countries. So the level of freedom actually depends on country to country, within the country, which of the states, within the state, which of the districts. And finally, it comes down to you individually. Your country may be free and independent, celebrating, you know, you know, 76 year of independence. But what about you? What is your freedom? And when it comes to this baser level of freedom, essentially, and I'm someone who practiced Buddhism, which came from this country, and particularly from, from Kerala. Kerala used to be one of the richest practitioners of Buddhism. 
And in Buddhism it says, no one can harm you unless you allow yourself to be. No one. And that can happen if you continue to be more patient, kind, forgiving, and work on your anger, hatred, and greed. This is the base of your freedom. And if you work on this base of freedom, your country may not be free, but you're free. At least you are in the process of the freedom. And this is the lesson His Holiness the Dalai Lama gives us. So you see, you, there is the political aspiration of freedom, independence of Tibet, but there is a basal level. What kind of freedom I am seeking? And the greatness of practice of nonviolence is that in a practice of nonviolence, you, your sense of calm and peace is now, when you are in the process of seeking freedom. And also, the sense of calm and peace, even in future. You see, you are never out of touch from that freedom. So this is the freedom struggle we are undergoing for 70 years. Tibetan freedom movement doesn't make too much of headlines because we don't uh, kill Chinese. There are no Tibetan terrorists. Yeah, there is no bomb blasts. There's no air crash. But we don't mind. We don't mind not being on the, uh, on the top line. Uh, breaking news. We don't mind because we know where we are and where we are is where we want to be. But we weren't like this in the past. There was a point of time in the history of Tibet where the Tibetans were the most brutal warriors. Before Tibetans embraced Buddhism, Tibetans were warriors who invaded and bullied the Mongolians and the Chinese. Tibetans created a warrior empire in the heart of Asia. And when Buddhism came to Tibet, this idea of love and compassion brought a revolutionary change in the very nature of Tibetan civilization. It changed the way we thought and way we lived. Because we used to think that killing people, conquering land is glorious and there is happiness in this. After understanding Buddhism, we understood that true glory and happiness does not come from killing people or conquering land, but by killing your anger and con conquering your greed. You can kill people, occupy land in certain process of time, but you can never kill your anger and conquer your greed ever. It's a long process. And there is true peace in this, the true happiness in this. So you see, ours is a very different freedom struggle. I've been an activist all my life. I'm now 49. I've been writing poetry. I've been climbing buildings. I've been going to protest rallies. And whenever Chinese presidents, prime ministers come to India, I go out to protest. And Indian intelligence officers, they know. So they come behind me. So we play Tom and Jerry gang. So whenever Chinese comes here, then there is a problem between the Tibetan activists and the Indian intelligence. Otherwise, we are friends. We have chai. And obviously, you know, after doing some protests, I get arrested. I go to jail. I've been to jail so many times, 16 times. So I've now become jail expert, you know. Uh, so I have experiences and many of my friends joke with me saying that you've been to so many jails, you should write a jail guidebook which would be useful for Indian politicians. So last time my jail was in Chennai when uh, 
Modi ji and uh, Xi Jinping had coconut, tender coconut together. Remember? Chennai summit? At the time when I was arrested, I was telling uh, the SHO, station head office. I was telling him, I'm not enemy. The real enemy is Xi Jinping. You should arrest him. So he was obviously laughing like, ha ha, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. You can say whatever you want, but please go in. I was sent to Pural Jail, Central Jail in Chennai. And after my release, I went back to Himachal and from there I called him again. We are now friends. SHO and me, we are now friends. So I called him again. I'm telling you, I'm not the enemy. Xi Jinping is the enemy. And he was again laughing. Ha, ha, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, sir, okay, sir. After Galwan Valley, when 20 Indian soldiers were killed, I called him again. I told you, I'm not the enemy. China is the enemy. Then he said, oh, sorry, sir, you are correct, sir, you are correct, sir. Then you understood. <laughs> so you see, there is this great relationship between the country of India and Tibet. My friend Ramachandra who is there. We've been friends for 20 years. So <laughs> once we were discussing relationship, he'd come to Dharamshala. So we were discussing what is the relationship between far-flung Kerala and up in the snow mountains beyond the Himalayas, Tibet. And then he tell, told me something about Venchamaram. Venchamaram. The hair, the white hair, which you use when you sit on the elephant and air. It's sacred. It has to be absolutely pure and white and clean. That comes from Tibet. It's the yak tail. Did you know? It's a yak tail. It comes from Tibet. And when you, when you use Vanchamaram, if you don't get a yak tail, then you'll have to use plastic uh, fiber. <laughs> you know, something fluffy. And in Tibet, every religious function, there should be use of a shank, the white conch with which we blow. And Tibet is a landlocked country. It's 4,000 meters above sea level. Nine months of winter. There's no sea there. So anything from the sea is precious. It's a gem. So all the stories of Tibet ultimately has to do with crossing the sea in a turbulent, this kind of a ship. It has to do with this. There are a lot of stories, epics, about journey through... Oh, in, a, in a voyage where there are sea monsters and ultimately to get gems from the sea. So look at the romance of the sea for Tibetans and look at the romance of snow mountains for the people of Kerala. Very unique relationship. And now Dharamshala, we have so many Malayalis coming over there and some of them getting, getting married to Tibetan girls, we think like, oh, uh, we are losing our girls also. So there, is, there are intermarriages also. So interestingly, so this freedom struggle that we are leading today is actually become a test of non-violence. People are not talking about it, but most people, because of predominance of violence in political activism and in nation building, many people think that non-violence has come to an end after Gandhi. Then there was Martin Luther King. Then there was Nelson Mandela. And then there is Aung San Suu Kyi in Burma. But His Holiness the Dalai Lama has been holding on to the idea and practice of non-violence and compassion leading Tibetan freedom movement even today. Although people are not talking about it, but everybody is waiting, silently watching. Where is the Tibetan freedom movement going towards? They are quietly desiring that the Tibetan freedom struggle becomes successful, which would then give reassurance of non-violence and compassion to the world. Some of the biggest countries, United States, Russia, China, are the most irresponsible countries. 
at the slightest of provocation, they lead violence and war. And we are still begging to be peaceful and non-violent. This freedom movement is more difficult than any kind of violence countries unleash in the world. This freedom movement needs intellectual leadership, spiritual practice, and the physical endurance with which we lead the freedom movement and show this as an example to the rest of the world and reassure that non-violence and compassion is not dead idea, it is still here and we are all, all potential practitioners of this because we are proving it and this I think is the is the predominant idea why Tibet matters. It's an example. Because everybody desires peace and happiness. But very, very few are working really in this, submitting their life in this process. And therefore, what are we, what are we actually teaching the younger generation to the students? Are we really telling them that it is the power of money? Are we really telling them that the brutal force of guns can overcome everything? Are we really telling them that we have actually lost teachings of all the religions? Teachings of all the religions about love and compassion? Are we really passing on them to them just rituals of different religions? It's a serious question I wanted to raise here on this, pla this platform with some submission from my side as, as an activist and as a writer in the freedom movement. Um, towards the end, I want to read a poem. This is, this is a poem that I've written uh, based in Dharamshala. Um, a common thing between Kerala and Himachal Pradesh where I stay now is the rains you get a lot of rain here we also get a lot of rains there and the rains that we re re receive in Dharamshala originates from Kerala you get monsoon from the first week of uh, June towards the end of June we get the monsoon in Dharamshala but Dharamshala receives second highest amount of rain after Chirapunji we get so much of rain, three months, July, August, September, continuous. So much of rain, when we say it rains cats and dogs in, in English, maybe here also you say it's raining cats and dogs. But in Dharamshala, it rains cats, dogs and donkeys. So much of rain. Sometimes it keeps raining for two to three days continuously. We forget that there is some sunshine. So wrote a poem called When It Rains in Dharamshala. So I'm going to read that poem. And um, I don't know, uh, from here, how many of you have been to Dharamshala? Let me, let me see by raising hands. How many people? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, five people. But those who have not come, please come. Yeah? Register and come to Dharamshala, okay? Um, and when you come to Dharamshala, you must come during the rainy season. You know why? The reason is, it's, it is during rainy season that Dharamshala is most beautiful. During the rains, the rains actually wash out all the industrial clout that comes from Punjab and Haryana. So during rainy season, the sky is clear and blue. And, and from the height of Maklod Ganj, you can actually see and count the small houses in the Kangra valleys. And it is only during the rainy season, you can see a lake. There is a lake at the far western horizon. It's visible only during rainy season. You should come, but please bring your jones and poppies, your umbrellas. Don't bring cheap Chinese umbrellas. They'll all go tatters like tissue papers.
It's a terrible rain there. So anyway, with that advisory, I'll read the poem here. So the poem is titled When It Rains in Dharamshala. And the poem is about a rented room. The room that I have rented and pay my room rent and I live. So this poem is about that house. So the poem is titled When It Rains in Dharamshala. <clears throat> When it rains in Dharamshala, raindrops wear boxing gloves. Thousands of them come crashing down and beat my room. Under its tin roof, my room cries from inside and wets my bed, my papers. Sometimes the clever rain comes from behind my room. The treacherous walls lift their heels and allow a small flood into my room. I sit on my island nation bed and watch my country in flood. Notes on freedom, memoirs of my prison days, letters from college friends, crumbs of bread and maggi noodles, rice sprightly to the surface, like a sudden recovery of a forgotten memory. Three months of torture. Monsoon in the needle-leaved pines. Himalaya rinsed clean. Glistens in the evening sun. Until the rain calms down and stops beating my room, I need to console my tin roof, who has been on duty from the British Raj. This room has sheltered many homeless people. Now captured by mongooses and mice, lizards and spiders, and partly rendered by me. A rented room for a home is a humbling existence. My Kashmiri landlady, my Kashmiri landlady at 80 cannot return home. We often compete for beauty, Kashmir or Tibet. Every evening I return to my rented room. But I'm not going to die this way. There has got to be some way out of here. I cannot cry like my room. I have cried enough in prisons and in small moments of despair. There has got to be some way out of here. I cannot cry. My room is wet enough. So that's my poem. Towards the end, I want to make a proposal. And please consider this very seriously. I'm making this proposal to Kerala. Because of global warming, sea level is rising. And when it happens, Kerala perhaps going to be one of the first to be affected. Maybe after some time, Peruvanam may not be there. And your Thiruvananthapuram will be the, perhaps the first one to go on the sea. So my proposal is, support Tibet today. Tomorrow when Tibet becomes independent, we'll take you to Tibet. So this is my proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this is a book of poems that I've written. I sell it for 50 rupees, 50 rupees. This is the cheapest book of poems. I have more copies with me. In case you are interested, I sell it for 50 rupees. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Yeah, and um, there, is there is this little pamphlet about Friends of Tibet. Friends of Tibet is a Tibet support group started by Setu Das, who is in uh, Ernakulam. His father was Yesu Dasan. Uh, the great uh, Malayal Manorama uh, cartoonist and artist. Yeah? So this is Friends of Tibet. I have more booklets like this, pamphlets with me. Please take in, in case you take interest. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, sir, for spreading the idea of freedom, unity, and r human rights through your works. Thank you so much for your insightful presentation. On behalf of Sarva Mangala Trust, we extend our heartfelt gratitude for your presence and wonderful talk at Peruvanam International Village Festival 2023. Mumbai, Nagaratil Kodamanye, Peyan Dodangambo.
തണുപ്പിൽ നിന്നും രക്ഷയ്ക്കുള്ള മാർഗവുമായിട്ട് കമ്പിളി പതപ്പുകളുമായിട്ട് ടിബറ്റുകാർ അവിടുത്തെ ഫുട്പാത്തുകളിൽ വരാറുണ്ട് അവരോട് ഐക്യദാരം പ്രഖ്യാപിക്കാനായിട്ട് ഞങ്ങളെല്ലാവരും സ്വെറ്റർ വാങ്ങിക്കാറുണ്ട് ഓരോ വർഷവും സ്വെറ്റർ വാങ്ങിക്കുന്നത് ഇവരോടുള്ള ഒരു ഐക്യദാർഢ്യമായിട്ടാണ് അവർക്ക് പറയാനുള്ളത് അദ്ദേഹം പറഞ്ഞ പോലെ അമ്പത്തൊമ്പതിൽ ഇന്ത്യയിൽ വന്നു പല സ്ഥലങ്ങളിലായിട്ട് അവർ സെറ്റിൽ ചെയ്തു ബയലക്കുപ്പ കർണാടകയിലെ ബയലക്കുപ്പയിൽ ധരംശാലയിലൊക്കെ സെറ്റിൽ ചെയ്തു ബയലക്കുപ്പയിൽ സെറ്റിൽ ചെയ്തിട്ടുള്ള ആളുകൾ അവരുടെ പെര എല്ലാ വർഷവും നമ്മൾ മേയുന്ന പോലെ മേയുമ്പോൾ കാരണവന്മാർ പറയും അത്രയൊന്നും ആഞ്ഞു മേയണ്ട അടുത്ത വർഷം നമുക്ക് അങ്ങോട്ട് തിരിച്ചു പോകാനുള്ളതാണെന്ന് പറയുന്നത് ഈ പ്രതീക്ഷയ്ക്ക് അമ്പത്തൊമ്പത് തൊട്ട് അറുപത്തിനാല് വർഷമാവുകയാണ് അറുപത്തിനാല് വർഷമായിട്ടും അവർ പ്രതീക്ഷ കൈവിട്ടിട്ടില്ല അവരുടെ അക്ഷരങ്ങൾ അവരുടെ ഭാഷ അവരുടെ സംസ്കാരം അവരുടെ മരുന്നുകൾ അതിനെല്ലാം അവർ കാത്തുസൂക്ഷിച്ചുകൊണ്ടേയിരിക്കുന്നു ദലായിലാമയുടെ പിറന്നാളിൻ്റെ അന്ന് അവിടുത്തെ വലിയ പൈസ ചിലവൊന്നുമില്ലാത്ത ഏതെങ്കിലും ചാലുകളിൽ കൊച്ചുമുറികളിൽ ഒരു ഒത്തുകൂടും പണ്ടത്തെ നമ്മുടെ തിരുവാതിരക്കളി പോലുള്ള അവരുടെ കൊച്ച് അനൗപചാരിക നൃത്തങ്ങളൊക്കെ ഓരോരുത്തരും ആ ചുവടുകൾ ഓർത്തെടുത്ത് ഓർത്തെടുത്ത് ചവിട്ടും പാരമ്പര്യ വിദ്യകൾ പാരമ്പര്യ വൈദ്യശാസ്ത്രവുമായിട്ട് ബന്ധപ്പെട്ട എല്ലാ നാട്ടറിവുകളും സമാഹരിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് അതിൽ നിന്നും അവരിൽ നിന്ന് ഡോക്ടർമാരുണ്ടാവുന്നു ചികിത്സ നടത്തുന്നു കേരളത്തിലെ പല സ്ഥലങ്ങളിലും അവർ ഓരോ വർഷം വന്ന് ക്യാമ്പുകൾ നടത്തുന്നു അങ്ങനെയാണ് അവരുടെ അക്ഷരത്തിനെ ഭാഷയെ സംസ്കാരത്തിന് അവർ കാത്തു സൂക്ഷിക്കുന്നത് അവരുടെ ആ ഭാഷയോടും സംസ്കാരത്തോടും അതിനെ കാത്തു സൂക്ഷിക്കാനുള്ള അവരുടെ വ്യഗ്രതയോടുള്ള ഐക്യദാർഢ്യമായിട്ട് ഈ സർവമംഗലയുടെ ലിറ്റ് ഫെസ്റ്റ് അവരോട് കണ്ണു ചേരുകയാണ് ശ്രീ ടെൻസിൻ സിന്ധുവിന് നമ്മുടെ ഒരു ഉപഹാരം സമ്മാനിക്കുന്നതിന് വേണ്ടിയിട്ട് ഞാൻ റിയാസ് കോമുവിനെ വേദിയിലേക്ക് ക്ഷണിക്കുക വി ജോയിൻ യുവർ ഡ്രീം ദറ്റ് ബൈലക്കുപ്പ ഗ്രാൻഡ് ഫാദേഴ്സ് യൂസ് ടു സേ ഡോൺ ഡു ടു മച്ച് വി ഹാവ് ടു ഗോ ബാക്ക് ദിസ് എ ബുക്ക് റിട്ടൺ ബൈ കുഷ നങ്ങ്യാർ Thank you so much, sir. Thank you once again for being part of this International Pirivanam International Festival. Thank you so much.